Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 4, and uh, let's read uh, verses uh, 14 through uh, 30. So let's everybody get our Bibles, and uh, let's read together. And here is a unique passage again to Luke. Now, none of the other Gospels mention this in detail, and, th- and Luke is the only one mentioned, uh, mentions that as his um, custom was. But uh, let's uh, stand, let's turn to Luke chapter 4, and verses 14 through uh, 30. And let's everybody read together uh, in uh, unison. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified for God. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as custom was, he went into the synagogue Amen. What a tremendous passage in the Word of God. This morning we want to look into this passage in the Luke uh, Gospel of Luke. And the reason why we're dealing with it, we've been dealing with the Gospel of Luke in recent days. And uh, as you read the Gospel of Luke, here's a passage that sort of jumps out at you. And uh, it's a passage in the Word of God that uh, really speaks to our heart. And uh, there's so much here uh, to really uh, deal with. It's very, very edifying and uh, very, very uh, uplifting. Now, uh, what we have here in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through uh, 30, is a, the story of a person who went to his hometown and preached in his hometown church, and uh, as a result of preaching that one message, everybody wanted to murder him. Now, this is the only place you read about that is in the Bible. Here is someone went to his hometown, preached in his hometown synagogue, and as we read uh, the Word of God, as a result of preaching one message in his hometown synagogue, everybody wanted to murder him. Now, that's what we read about here and what we read this morning in the Word of God. Now, As you look here in Luke chapter uh, 4 and verse 16, we find here that the Lord Jesus comes to his hometown synagogue. Now, as you read about it in uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, and of course Nazareth was the town he was brought up in. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, 
but he was brought up in the town of uh, Nazareth, there where Mary and Joseph lived. And the Bible says in uh, Luke 4 and verse 16, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought, um, uh, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, that's the only time you have that in the gospel, as his custom was. In other words, over and over again, Jesus went into the synagogue, you see, and he was faithful in his worship to God in the synagogue. The Bible says here in Luke 4, 16, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue say, on the Sabbath uh, day. So that was his custom, that was his practice, since uh, a very uh, young person to go into the synagogue. And the Bible says in verse 16, on the Sabbath day, and he stood up uh, to read. Now, uh, number one, as we get the background here and the context, what we have here in the Bible uh, is the word synagogue. Now, uh, in the Bible, there was only one temple, but there are many synagogues. Now, the priest ministered at the temple. They did not minister in the synagogues. Now, the synagogues were the, you might uh, say, are, were like the local uh, churches spread all over uh, the, country, uh, uh, the countryside. And the Jews would go there uh, every Sabbath day, and uh, they'd hear the Word of God and the teaching of uh, the Word of God in the synagogue. Now, about three times a year, they were required to go to the Jewish temple. Now, but now, you see, uh, the synagogues, they went every Sabbath day. And then the person in charge of the synagogue, we read about that uh, in the book of Acts and the book uh, of Luke, the Bible uh, uh, talks about uh, the person in charge of uh, the synagogue. And there was a local person there, uh, who was in charge of uh, the synagogue. But uh, see, this was where the Jews went and where uh, they would uh, honor the Lord, worship the Lord on every, uh, you see, Sabbath day. Now, the word synagogue uh, comes from two words, the word bring and the word together. See, in other words, it was God's will for all the, uh, the people to be brought together, the Jewish people in the Jewish synagogue, on uh, the Sabbath uh, uh, day. Now, it's very interesting when we learn about the service that was conducted in the Jewish synagogue. Now, for instance, uh, number one, they had prayer. And uh, in the Jewish synagogue, they had a time of prayer. And then number two, as uh, we learn about the synagogue, they read from the law, and then they read from the prophets. So it was a time of prayer, and then they read from the law, they read from the uh, prophets, from the Word of God. And then if there was somebody there that was capable of teaching, or maybe a visiting rabbi, or uh, someone like that, then they would be invited to teach the Word of God that was based on that particular uh, a scripture. So uh, that's what the synagogue was all about. That's why, see, uh, Luke was very, very familiar with the synagogue because he was a fellow traveler of the Apostle Paul, and uh, Luke was with Paul on many occasions when Paul was literally kicked out of the synagogue, stoned, beaten, uh, thrown in jail, persecuted, and uh, so forth. But see, what the synagogue was, when someone like the Apostle Paul would even come, see, because Paul was a rabbi before he got saved, and he said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and so they'd look upon Paul, and they'd say, well, you come if you want to say a few words, and then he'd go in the synagogue, and he would uh, preach the gospel from the Old Testament and from uh, the Word of uh, God. Now, see, but, uh, and that was a synagogue, see, and the Bible says from a little boy, Jesus Christ, custom was to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath uh, day as we uh, read the Word of God. Now, and the Jewish families would attend with their children from even a youngest age uh, to the synagogue. And again, now, the purpose of the synagogue was a time of prayer, a time of reading the Bible, and then a time of teaching of 
the Word of God. Now, the Bible says, see, as His custom was, and that was the custom of the Lord Jesus Christ, see, to go to the synagogue on um, the, the Sabbath uh, day. Now, uh, there's a, a great lesson for all of us right there, because, see, Jesus was faithful in his worship to God. Now, of course, we are not under the Old Testament law. We're under grace today. And after the resurrection, every time Jesus Christ met with his disciples, he met on the first day of uh, the week as we read uh, the Word of God. Now, see, the synagogue was not the same as the church, but there's a lot of similarities in the Bible between the church and uh, the synagogue. For instance, a uh, well-known verse in the Bible, in Hebrews 10, 25, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. So much more as you see Jesus Christ coming for his second coming, how we need to be in the word of God and hear the gospel uh, or the word of God and be edified in the things of God. But you see, that word in Hebrews 10, 25 is the word synagogue. You say, forsake not the synagoguing of ourselves together. Why? You say, um, it's talking about the local church. Say, the local church is not the synagogue, but there's a lot of similarities between the Jewish synagogue and the local church. And that word is even used there in uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, uh, 25. Say, they're not the same but they're similar in a lot of ways. There's a lot of uh, similarity uh, there. Now, see, the word church means to be called together. That's what the word church means in the Bible, to be called together. Now, the word synagogue is a word that means to bring together. See, so they're very similar uh, concepts in uh, the Word of God. And uh, that uh, helps us to understand about the early New Testament church. And as we study about uh, the church in the Word of God, the word church is used about 112 times in the New Testament. And in uh, uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, remember the apostle said, we will give ourselves to prayer, number one, and then number two, to the ministry of the Word of God. And I believe that helps us to understand what went on in the New Testament uh, church. See, the synagogue was a place of prayer, a place of reading the Word of God, and then a place of the teaching of the Word of God. And that's what the church is all about. As you study uh, the Word of God, uh, there's no fanfare in the church. By the way, as you study the Bible, there are no programs in the Bible, not a single program that you read about in the Bible. Uh, just like the synagogue, there wasn't any programs there. But you see, it's a place of prayer and the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Now, suppose in every church in America today, it was a place of prayer where people knew the Lord and they prayed and then they read and they studied the Word of God. Uh, uh, overnight, America would be transformed. Now, most churches today are entertainment centers or they're filled with uh, programs in one way or another, and there's very little emphasis on prayer and very little emphasis on uh, the Word of God. By the way, uh, just an interesting side note here, and that is there is no such thing uh, in the uh, Bible as an invisible synagogue. See, a synagogue was a local uh, place of assembly in a local geographical area. Just like the Bible never teaches that there is an invisible church. Now, that has done a lot of harm to the Christian community. See, we are not to forsake ourselves, uh, forsake the assembling of ourselves in the, the local church, the, the, the local church today. Jesus, as his custom was, say, went to a literal geographical uh, synagogue. So now he goes to the synagogue and he has this reputation 
as someone who had previously performed miracles, and as we uh, read the Word of God, probably the first three chapters of the Gospel of John had already taken place contextually in relation to what we have here in Luke chapter uh, uh, 4. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 4, in verses 17 through 19, the Bible uh, says here, uh, as his custom was, verse 16, and on the Sabbath day, see, he stood up to read the Word of God. And so, evidently, they realized he was someone who had the reputation to be able to teach the Bible, to teach the Word of God. Now, and the Bible says, and there was delivered unto him, you see, the book of the prophets. So now they came to that place where they are reading from one of the Old Testament prophets. Now, uh, the prophet that they're reading from here, obviously, is Isaiah, verse 17. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, See, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Isaiah chapter 61, and it is speaking of the Messiah and when the Messiah would come. Now, um, as you read there in verse 17, uh, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me, see, to preach. And then you have about uh, five things that are listed uh, here in the Word of God that, you see, will be uh, very descriptive of the ministry of the Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of uh, the world. Now, as we read here in verse 18, he says, He anointed me, see, to preach the gospel to the poor. Say, to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, it does not say, and nowhere in the New Testament does the Bible ever teach that Jesus came to feed the poor. It is not there. It is not found in the Bible. Even the feeding of the 5,000, they were there late into the day, uh, and they were hungry. It wasn't poor people that were there. Just a multitude came. That has nothing to do with feeding poor people when he fell, uh, fed the, the multitudes in the evening uh, when they were hungry as a result of following him. Now, the Bible uh, says here, you see, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, um, what is the main thing that every poor person needs? You take uh, the city of uh, Newark, New Jersey. Now, now, in Newark, there are many, many poor people. Now, 70% of the children in Newark, New Jersey, do not know who their father is, and they're living in a, uh, a fatherless uh, a home. There's a lot of poor people in the city of Newark. Now, a lot of people misinterpret the Bible and even a, a verse like this in the Bible, and they say, well, we need more political action in the city of Newark, or we need more money. See, we need to pour about a billion dollars in the city of Newark, uh, New Jersey, and then that would straighten out uh, all of their uh, problems. By the way, what was it the other day? What was it? Three or four people were killed, and I believe it was in daylight, shot in daylight, on one of the main streets there uh, in, in Newark. But I'm using that as an illustration. See, what Newark needs more than anything else is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Say, to change lives. Say, uh, men will not run around as adulterers if they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You see, and, um, but now what does Jesus say? Say, I did not come to feed the poor, but to preach the gospel to the poor. You see, and that was the ministry of Jesus Christ to give out the word of God, the message of salvation, the gospel of the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. And then uh, um, the second thing that he uh, reads here and is talking about and preaching about, uh, it says here, he had sent me to heal the broken uh, uh, hearted. Now, say, sin breaks hearts. Uh, hearts are broken as a result of sin. See, and uh, we, we uh, see that. We are living in a heartbroken society. 
Now, uh, Jesus said here, a beautiful thing in the Word of God, Isaiah 61. You say, to heal the broken hearted. See, uh, as we uh, think of how sin breaks hearts, how uh, uh, people are sad, say they are broken hearted. And Jesus Christ said here, you see, to heal the broken hearted. He has an answer to those who are broken hearted. In other words, whose lives are all messed up. Sometimes we could even ask the question, who does not have a broken heart? Say, Jesus Christ is the answer to the broken heart. A friend of mine used to sing the song, uh, most all the places he'd go in the revival meetings and any uh, church and so forth. And he was a blessed gospel singer. And one of his favorite songs that he would sing, and every time he would sing that song, uh, just about every time, someone would come up to uh, him. His name was Skip, Skip Britton. And uh, they'd say, Skip, that song has touched my heart. That song blessed my heart. Say, that song encouraged me. And the song that he sang was Heartaches. I checked our hymn book. I don't think it's in the, the hymn book, but it's a great, great song. And the title of the song is Heartbreaks. When your heart is aching, turn to Jesus. He's the dearest friend that you can know. You will find him standing close beside you, waiting, uh, uh, waiting peace and comfort to bestow. Heartaches, take them all to Jesus. Go to him today. Do it now without delay. Heartaches, take them all to Jesus. He will take your heartaches all away. Well, Jesus said here, to heal broken hearts. And see, life is filled with broken people and broken hearts. Now, see, Jesus said, according to Isaiah here, he came to heal the brokenhearted. And then uh, uh, number three, see, to preach deliverance to the captives. And, and he would elaborate on all these things in the teaching of uh, the Word of God. Now, he says here, deliverance, you see, uh, to uh, the captives. Now, the Bible is very, very clear that sin causes people to be slaves of their uh, sin. Sin makes people slaves to their uh, uh, sin. No question about that uh, uh, in the Word of God. Now, see, now when it says here to preach deliverance, say, our freedom, liberty to Captives. Now, what he's talking about, see, are the captives of sin. See, people who are dominated by sin. They are in the prison of sin. See, uh, they are dominated by their sin. Now, uh, Jesus Christ said here, you see, to preach deliverance to the captives. Now, as we study the Word of God, the Bible is very, very clear Jesus Christ did simply, simply did not come, see, to preach deliverance. See, that, uh, he did, but that's not the primary reason uh, why he came. He did not primarily come uh, to bring about uh, deliverance, you see, uh, that type uh, of a thing. See, to bring deliverance. See, now here is the teaching of the Word of God. See, Jesus Christ is deliverance. He is deliverance. He doesn't come to bring it. He is deliverance. And he's the only one that can deliver someone from their sin. See, and uh, as he uh, would elaborate on this after the reading of uh, the Word of God. See, he is deliverance. See, he is the only one who can bring deliverance from a person's sin in their life. See, there is no other answer to sin apart from the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Turn in your Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we see this clearly illustrated in the Word of God. Now, um, again, we find that people are slaves to sin. They are dominated by sin. 
uh, and uh, so forth. But now in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So now here you have a very negative statement in the Bible. And uh, he lists several people here who will not go to heaven, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, be not deceived. Now, don't let anybody tell you that everybody goes to heaven. Don't let everybody, anybody tell you that everybody is saved. Now, so he said, Paul says, don't uh, um, be deceived. Now, he says, neither fornicators, uh, and we know what a fornicator is, uh, those that have sex outside or before marriage, and then idolaters, those who worship in idol, will not go to heaven. They are not uh, members of God's kingdom. And then adulterers, and that uh, certainly refers to the Bill Gateses of the world, the Mario Cuomos of the world, and so many of the political leaders all about us uh, in sports world and politics and uh, every month we read about some school teacher uh, right here in the local area who's going astray in this particular uh, area. See now, see now, Jesus Christ is a deliverer of people that are enslaved to that sin. And then he says, effeminate nor abusers of self, themselves with mankind. Say, what is the answer to homosexuality? What is the answer to transgenderism? See, and that is the delivering power of Jesus Christ. See, he can set that captive free. See, they're captive. They're in bondage uh, to uh, their sin. And then he says thieves. We know what thieves are. And covetous and drunkards. What's the answer uh, to drunkenness? Someone might say, well, the AAA or the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, that type of a thing. See, now the Bible says, see, Jesus Christ is a deliverer from alcoholism, from drunkenness. See, that's the teaching of the Bible. See, he's a deliverer. Now, um, and then uh, it says here, drunkards, revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul is saying that we know that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And... Um, then in verse uh, 11, he says, and such were some of you. Now, you see, that's the way Paul says you used to live. That was the uh, characterized several of the church members in Corinth. They were former adulterers, fornicators, idolaters, homosexuals, and they got saved. They were redeemed. See, they were captives who were set free and delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, and such, now, by the way, uh, some of the liberals, it's really amazing how, uh, how ignorant they are, and that's putting it diplomatically. Uh, see, they take this word here, and they say, well, when it says, and such were some of you, no question about the word. See, the word in the text is the word were some of you. Some of the liberals like to change that and say, some are you. <laughs> Isn't that crazy how somebody take the Bible and pervert the Bible to make it say what they want it to say? See, it's not and such are, but it's such were some of you, but ye are washed. See, they were washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, see, they were captives to, these, uh, to this sin. They were slaves to that sin but they were delivered through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, see, what was the message Paul came that delivered these people from homosexuality, alcoholism, and all types of vicious, terrible sins that we just read about in the Word of God? Now, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you. So he's talking about when he came. When he originally came and he preached in the city of Corinth. Now, the Bible uh, says here, I determined not to know anything among you, save or accept Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, I preached the cross 
and how through the blood of Christ and the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross of Calvary, you can be washed from your sins. And there are some homosexuals in the audience. There are some adulterers and idolaters in the audience, and they got saved. They came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that's what the church there uh, was built uh, upon. But see, what we're thinking about here in uh, Luke chapter uh, 4 is uh, this matter of setting uh, the captives free. See, in chapter 4 uh, there, where it says, uh, to heal the broken part, uh, hearted and to preach deliverance to the captives. See, only Jesus Christ, through his power, can set someone free, you see, from, you see, uh, the enslavement or the captivity of sin. That's the work of Jesus Christ. That's what he came into the world to do. Say, to set you and me free from our bondage to sin as we read uh, the Word of God. And I mention it different times, and uh, I can't help but mentioning whenever we study about something like this, uh, a dear, dear, dear friend of mine uh, whose name was Dr. Marcourt. Dr. Marcourt had two graduate degrees from Harvard Medical School. Not one, but two. He had an MD degree, and then he had another degree from uh, Harvard Medical School. He was a very brilliant man, an outstanding uh, a man in the uh, academic world. And uh, Dr. Marcourt was a practicing psychiatrist, a board-certified psychiatrist. And he had the, the practice there, and a man came to him one day, and he said, uh, Dr. Marcourt, uh, you're a psychiatrist. He said, I am an alcoholic, and I want you to help me to overcome my alcoholism. And I'm a drunkard, and I, I know it's ruined my life, my family's life, and everybody, and so I want to get rid of this thing. And so he prescribed what the average psychiatrist would tell an alcoholic about how the steps and so forth to overcome his alcoholism. And then he said a couple of months later, he had an appointment with Dr. Marcourt, and he came to Dr. Marcourt, and he said, uh, he said, Dr. Marcourt, he said, I've been delivered from alcoholism. I am not an alcoholic anymore. And Dr. Marcourt said, what do you mean? And uh, he said, I got saved. I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And this man said, Jesus Christ delivered me from my alcoholism. And then uh, um, he said to Dr. Marcourt, uh, this famous uh, psychiatrist, he said, you need to be saved. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. And lo and behold, Dr. Marcourt got saved. He got, came to know Christ as his Savior, devoted the rest of his life to teaching the Bible, teaching the Word of God at Christian uh, institutions. And I, I remember Dr. Marcord on many, many occasions said that this book is the greatest authority on human behavior. Is the Bible the Word of God? And he became an outstanding man of God. I remember he mentioned one time that he was going to one of the Ivy League schools, either to speak at a convention or attend a convention, after he got saved. And uh, he said he walked on that campus, and he said there was a student up in a tree uh, on the limb, and he was studying, you know, studying uh, for an exam or something. And he said he walked down uh, through the campus there to uh, this uh, seminar convention that he's going to. And I never forget it. You know, some things you never forget when people tell you. And he said, you know, he said, after I got saved and I entered into that campus of a Ivy League school, I'll not mention it, but it's uh, in the state of New Jersey in the city of Princeton. And uh, so, uh, and, and he said, I felt after I got saved, that it was entering into a zoo. That's the way he described it. 
say, a zoo after he got saved. See, it's like uh, people have no spiritual light at all. They're in darkness. They're acting and living and talking like uh, animals. You see, they had no freedom in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, see, um, what we're getting at, see, Jesus Christ sets the captive free. Say, people are in bondage. The gospel sets them free. Say, changes their life. Say, that's what we read in 1 Corinthians. And such were some of you. Many of you heard about the testimony years ago of Chuck Colson. And uh, Chuck Colson was the advisor uh, to the president. He was an attorney, uh, captain in the Marines, a successful lawyer, and he was a practice uh, a advisor to uh, the president at that time, and then they had the Watergate scandal, and uh, Chuck Colson winds up in prison, and then uh, Chuck Colson got saved, and uh, then he got uh, associated with some uh, Baptist preachers, and he really did a lot of good in uh, uh, the church to bring a lot of people to the Lord, help people come to the Lord after he got saved, and so forth, but uh, Chuck Colson said, the worst day in my life, see, after he got saved now, and he was delivered from all that pride and all that egotism and all of that uh, power, see, he was delivered uh, uh, from it. Then he gave his testimony, and he said, the worst day in my life as a Christian, and he said, I've had some bad days in my life as a Christian, but he said, the worst day in my life as a Christian, was a thousand times better than my best day in the White House before I was saved. In other words, say, Jesus Christ delivers captives from sin. Now, he was in the White House, he's famous, but uh, he said it was all to no avail, no peace, no joy, no direction in his life until he got saved. Now, see, the Bible talks here about deliverance, uh, to, the Bible says, the captives, those that are in captive to sin. Now, Jesus Christ is saying, I am the deliverer. I am the redeemer. Now, what does that word set free, captive, redeemer, mean? See, it talks about being set free from the power of sin in my life. Now, Jesus is preaching this in the synagogue. And then the fourth thing that uh, the Bible uh, says here, you see, is recovering of sight to uh, the blind. Now, again, here in the context, I do not believe it's talking about physical sight. Now, Jesus did heal, the Bible says, many people of their blindness. But I am sure, as you read the context here, study Isaiah, study the Word of God, what this is talking about, you see, is spiritual uh, a blindness. See, every person in the world outside of Jesus Christ is spiritually blind. Now, say 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, say, of whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. See, every unsaved person is in spiritual darkness according to the Bible. Now, remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 3. He said, except a man be born again, remember what Jesus said, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, he used the word see there. Now, what he's talking about, say, Nicodemus, you are a religious leader. You're a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You're the uh, main teacher, Bible teacher in Israel. And when you study out the context and get into the text, that's what he's saying about Nicodemus. See, you are the key Bible teacher here in Israel. And he said, yet you cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Say, Nicodemus, you are spiritually blind. And until you get born again, your spiritual eyes will not be open because you are spiritually blind. Now, see, and that's why Jesus told Nicodemus three times, ye must be born 
again. Say you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. You need to be born again in order to go to heaven and uh, be saved and so forth. And uh, after the master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ said that to Nicodemus three times. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? I don't have the vaguest idea what you're talking about. In fact, he said, what do you mean? I have to go back in my mother's womb and be born all over again. See, he was spiritually blinded. See, he took the spiritual in a physical sense. Now, you see, he was spiritually blind. And the Bible teaches, you see, every person is spiritually blind. See, uh, they are blind spiritually, they are blind morally, and they are blind uh, ethically. Now, if you don't believe that, turn on your radio. If you don't believe that, turn on your television. Everybody is spiritually blind, ethically, morally, religiously. I mean, everybody's mixed up. Why? Because they are spiritually blind. See, they do not have any spiritual insight whatsoever. Now, that's why Jesus said in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. Amen? Say, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, you see, but shall have the light of life. Say, I am the light of the world. Now, if you follow me, Jesus said, you will not walk in darkness. Say, spiritually and uh, morally and ethically, you will not be in darkness. Now, why aren't people in spiritual and moral and ethical darkness? Because they don't know the light of the world. Amen? They do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, I'm sure he commented on all these things. And um, see, what we're talking about is a man who went to his hometown synagogue and he preached one sermon and everybody wanted to murder him on the spot. That's what we're reading about. That's what uh, this is all about. And then, um, as you read on here, it says, To set at liberty them that are bruised and broken, and everybody is bruised and uh, uh, broken. So, uh, here's uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, um, the Bible says in verse 19, See, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And that is the year that the Messiah is here, that the Messiah has come, and the Messiah is here. Now, we'll read in just a couple of verses where Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in me. But here's an interesting uh, thought of Bible study. Turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter uh, 61. Now, in Isaiah chapter uh, 61, and this is what Jesus is reading from uh, here, Isaiah chapter uh, 61, and the Bible uh, says here, he, this is a passage he's using. See, Isaiah chapter uh, 61 and verses 1 and 2. See, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. See, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. See, spiritually. And then he says in Isaiah 61 and verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, what punctuation mark do you have in your Bible after the word uh, Lord? That's a comma. Now, you see, and that is where Jesus Christ stopped in the teaching of this passage in the Word of God. Now, that's very interesting. As we've said many, many times, we don't want to uh, overemphasize uh, and go into uh, pandemic uh, details but watch the commas in the Bible. Say, watch your Bible. Study your Bible. Observe what the Bible is saying. Because there's a comma, and Jesus Christ stops at a comma. Nobody stops at a comma. Jesus did. Why? Because, see, the verse goes on, and it says, um, 
and the day of the vengeance of our God. That's the second coming, when he brings judgment into the world. So he actually stops at a comma. See, and what he's talking about is the day and age of his first coming. He's not talking here about his second coming. He's not talking about that time of tribulation when the world will be turned into uh, uh, tribulation. But there is an interest, and that's why I've said many, many times, I do not appreciate people who do not seriously study the Bible. I've heard so many sermons and people talk about the Bible and they have no concern about a comma. They have no concern about what the Bible really says. They take it out of context. They preach a lot of good and interesting uh, things, but the only problem is it's not Bible. They do not take their Bible uh, seriously. How many times have you heard someone, maybe on radio, television, or somewhere, uh, where, and um, they use the Bible, and uh, you might say, well, we're not Bible scholars, but man, I read the Bible. I don't think that's what uh, the Bible says he's talking about. See, I don't think he's correctly interpreting the Bible. It seems like he, he's saying a lot of good things, and a lot of nice things, but uh, when you check it out in the Bible, what do you find? They're not following the Bible, Amen. See, they're not following the Word of God. But that's very, very interesting because between that comma, you have the first coming of Jesus Christ, and then you have the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, stops at a comma. Now, you see, there's a big difference between his first coming in grace and his second coming in uh, judgment. Now, look at verse 19. Now, and um, verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, what that's talking about is the first coming of the Messiah. When the Messiah will come in glory and blessing. A lot of people refer to it as a year of jubilee, but it's referring in its greater context to the Messiah and when the Savior will actually come into uh, the world. Now, and the Bible says here, uh, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, verse 20, you say, and verse uh, 21, uh, Jesus teaching on this passage. And he closed the book, that's the book of Isaiah, and he gave it again to the minister, say, the head of the synagogue. And he sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now, and they looked at him, and see, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He was filled by the Holy Spirit. And everybody knew that nobody ever taught like him. See, they realized this is divine. This is of God. Uh, there's something different. We've never heard anybody uh, teach like this. And then the Bible says, he began to say unto them. You see, verse 21. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. Now he said, you are standing in the presence of the one who has fulfilled that scripture, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, concerning the Messiah. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his uh, mouth. Now, um, see what Jesus is saying here, you see, uh, when he says, this day is a scripture fulfilled in your eyes, that it is fulfilled in me. See, I today, at this particular time, have fulfilled uh, the scripture. So it's me and it's now. You see, um, as he says, uh, uh, says here, this day is a scripture fulfilled in your eyes. In other words, you are experiencing the very Savior and Messiah of whom Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, uh, uh, spoke. Now, you see, in verse 22, we have the response here of the people. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. Now, see, they heard Jesus Christ teaching here. And no one could ever teach and preach like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in a sense, it says they wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out 
of his mouth. See, and in a sense, they said that uh, we've never heard anything like this. We never heard anybody uh, preach, teach uh, like this. And, uh, and even in such a gracious way. In other words, it really got a hold of our hearts. It got a hold of our, our minds. But then in verse 22, it says, And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now, wait, and there you see how fickle people are and how people can change very, very quickly and on the spot. See, number one, uh, he's preaching gracious words. It, it, it seems like he, he's really telling the truth, but he's Joseph's son. He, he, I knew him. He made a table for me. He did some carpentry work over at my house. How could he be the Messiah? You see, he is just one of us. We knew him all his life. And uh, how can he have the audacity to say that he is the Messiah of Israel? After all, we know him and we know him as Joseph's son. Now, Jesus goes in here in verse 23 and he answers them. And he said unto them, um, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, where he did a lot of miracles. See, he did a lot of miracles in Capernaum. Do also here in thy country. So now what that proverb simply means is that, see, they heard Jesus Christ preach. See, that basically he is the only way of salvation. He's the only way that captives in sin can be set free. He is the fulfillment of the messianic promise, uh, prophecies according to Isaiah 61 and verses 1 and uh, 2. But now, see, Jesus read their mind. That shows that he's a divine son of God. He knew exactly how they were thinking. And what they said was basically what they're thinking. You do a miracle in our presence as you did in Capernaum and we will believe on you. The whole city of Nazareth will have a revival and everybody's going to believe in Jesus Christ if you simply perform a miracle. Now, if you perform a miracle, we will believe in you. Now, um, Jesus is not going to perform a miracle. Now, he said in the next verse, and he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And there's the context of it. And a lot of times it is hard to witness to your relatives. It is hard to witness to friends that uh, know us intimately. And there's where Jesus said, say, uh, no prophet, as he says here, is uh, accepted in his own country. This is where he's brought up. He had, his, he had his carpenter shop just down the road. They could see his carpenter shop probably from where they were standing, whatever. And... Uh, um, uh, 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 so forth. But now, you see, they want a miracle in order to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, now, see, what you have here in the Word of God, they rejected His Word. His Word was not good enough for them. See, the Word of God is not good enough. We want a miracle. And if you do a miracle, the whole city will believe in you. Now, uh, you see, miracles do not bring salvation. Now, remember Nicodemus came to Jesus, and remember Nicodemus said that no man, before he was saved, Nicodemus said, no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Nicodemus said, I know God is with you. I have observed your many miracles and I know you are from God. He believed in the deity, if not the, the divinity, if not the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, what did Jesus Christ say to Nicodemus? He said, ye must be born again. See, now that is what he actually said to Nicodemus. See, you need to be born again. Now, see, miracles did not save Nicodemus. Miracles do not save anybody. Now, miracles are given to attest the fact that Jesus Christ is 
the divine Son of God. But nobody is saved, you see, uh, simply through a miracle. See, that's what uh, uh, they wanted uh, here. Now, you see, Jesus knew that. Now, see, when you reject the Word of God, you see, um, no miracle is going to get you to believe the Word of God. See, they rejected His Word. Now, um, sometimes uh, people say, well, you see, I was in the hospital, I prayed, and I asked God to deliver me from the hospital, and He delivered me. So I know there's a God because I got out of the hospital. Well, that uh, may be the grace of God helping someone that's not Bible salvation. That doesn't, that doesn't mean somebody's saved. Somebody uh, says, well, God got me through the Vietnam War, got me through the foxhole, and uh, that, because of that, I'm saved. No, see, nobody is saved because they experience some type of thing similar uh, to that. And a lot of times people say, well, I had this experience, I went through it, and that's how I got uh, uh, saved. See, people are not saved through miracles. Now, a lot of times someone will say, well, I... Uh, was involved in dope addiction and so forth, and I had a turnaround in my life. Uh, somebody helped me overcome the drug, uh, drug addiction. See, that's not necessarily Bible salvation. See, they have met, uh, maybe experienced reformation, but not salvation. Now, turn to Luke chapter 18, or 16. And in Luke chapter 16, and the Bible says here in Luke 16, and verses 30 and uh, 31. Now, this is the authority of Jesus Christ. This is uh, Jesus talking about the man in hell who went to hell. And the Bible says in Luke 16 and verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but, well, in verse 29, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. By the way, you see the word repent there. Not that they'd simply believe, but they would repent. And, um, and he said unto, them, unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, this is Jesus Christ, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And someone might say, well, pastor... You mean to tell me if my mother came back from the dead and told me to be saved, that I wouldn't get saved? Yes, that's exactly what the Bible says. If, if your friend came back from the dead, you see, that doesn't mean you get saved. Oh, yes, if my brother who's dead came back, I believe. No, what Jesus said, if they don't believe the prophets, what is that? The word of God they will not believe if your brother and mother and father came back from the dead. Not everybody believed when Lazarus came back from the dead. Amen? Some did, but most did not. And the enemies of Christ said, now Lazarus is risen from the dead. Now we must murder Jesus Christ. We have to, we have to kill him because it's going too far. Uh, so much more of the Jews will believe on him. And so as a result of the resurrection uh, well, the resuscitation of Lazarus from the dead after being in the tomb three days. Say, what happened? His enemies got that much more hardened against Jesus Christ. Now, um, now what Jesus is saying, if someone will not get saved through the Bible, they'll never get saved through some hocus-pocus experience. They will not get saved through a miracle. The miracle will not bring them to Christ. You see, that is not the teaching. I'm not saved through a miracle. I'm saved through a Savior who is Jesus Christ. But now, he's not going to perform a miracle. You see, now, if he performed a miracle, the whole town would believe in him. You say, Pastor, why didn't he perform a miracle then? Because it would have been a shallow belief. It would have been some easy type believism. In other words, they would have uh, assented to his miracle, but that does not mean they would be saved. 
they would not realize they're sinners and they need a savior and need salvation. You see, you have a tremendous place here in the Bible where the Bible says Jesus did not please the crowd. He did not give the people what they wanted. Here, a miracle. He didn't do that. You see, there's a great lesson here in relation to evangelism and people coming to Christ. See, and that is we can never compromise the word of God. Don't try some hocus pocus to get somebody to believe in Jesus. You see, that's not the way it works, amen? If they're not going to be convicted through the word of God, they're never going to get saved. It has to be through the word of uh, God. And I think there's a great lesson here in, in evangelism. See, he could have gotten a lot of professions. The whole city could have, would have professed faith in Christ. Would they have been saved? Absolutely not, amen? See, they wouldn't have been saved. Why, they have to realize they're sinners and they need a Savior. Now, <laughs> see, that, that uh, is very, very uh, informative. See, a great lesson about evangelism. See, a lot of times evangelism is telling people what they want to hear. See, uh, getting some gimmick. Oh, I caught you. I caught you. You need to accept Christ. See, there's no hocus pocus in evangelism. See, if they do not, you see, get convicted through the word of God, they'll never get saved. And we see that very clearly here in uh, uh, the Bible. You see, let me encourage everybody who's a witness for Christ. Don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what God says in his word about sin, about judgment, about repentance, about salvation. Amen? It's a glorious, it's a good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, you see. And that's what we need to uh, emphasize. Here, Jesus Christ could have got the whole city to make a profession of faith. By the way, we don't have time to go into it. But see, Nazareth, remember what the Bible says somebody said about the city of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Most of the people that live, or many of the people that lived in Nazareth were not good people. They were not nice people. They were known to be sinners in the city of Nazareth. Can any good thing, can any good person come out of Nazareth? You see, and um, it's very interesting to tell you about now. Now, the whole town could have got saved, and he would have been able to write that up in the periodical. Everybody got saved in the town. Now, that leads you to the next part of the message. And he preached a sermon to them about Elijah and how Elijah was rejected. You read it on in the context by the Israelites. But he blessed a Gentile widow woman. And boy, that got under their skin. You mean a Gentile can be blessed by the God of Israel? And then he gives them a second uh, sermon there, and he talks about Elijah, or Elisha. Now, Elisha, there we read about that, is the one who was used to heal the only leper that we read about being healed in the Old Testament. And you remember that leper's name was Naaman. He was a Syrian. He was a Gentile. And, uh, and uh, e Elisha uh, was rejected by Israel, but he brings blessing to the uh, Gentile general uh, of Syria named Simon, or named, uh, uh, as we read there about Naaman. Uh, Naaman, the, uh, he was from Syria, his name was Naaman, and he was healed miraculously by uh, the Lord. Now, the same people that said, if you do a miracle, We'll all believe in you. Everybody in the city of Nazareth is going to believe in you. And Jesus preached a little sermon to them. And, it, and we see the reaction in verse 28. 
And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they're filled with anger and rage. And now, see what I'm talking about? The same people that wanted to miracle said, we'll believe in you if you do a miracle. And then the Bible uh, says here, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. I think that's the only person that I know of who ever preached a sermon in his hometown church one time, and as a result of preaching that sermon, they wanted to murder him. Have you ever heard of anybody who preached a sermon in the Garden State Baptist Church, or they come back in their hometown and uh, they preach the sermon? And after that one sermon, everybody wants to murder him. And they try to murder him. It's amazing when you study the Bible, amen? It's amazing as you study the Word of God. And hear the opposition of Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, why did Paul, uh, why does uh, Luke mention this? Say he was with Paul many, many times when Paul uh, got kicked out of the synagogues. He was with Paul when they wanted to murder Paul as a result of preaching the Word of God and uh, Jesus in the synagogues. But... As you read here in verse 29, they rose up, thrust him out of the city, and led him into the brow of the hill, the highest part of the hill. You see, uh, that's Nazareth, uh, was on a hill. There, uh, there on their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. Now, and that uh, refers to the stoning. See, they throw him off the cliff, and then they uh, put the boulders on him, they throw the stones on him, and they murder him. Now, here is the divine Son of God, the epitome of love and tenderness and kindness and salvation. He comes to his hometown. He preaches a sermon in the synagogue, and then everybody wants to murder him because of the sermon that he preached in the uh, synagogue uh, uh, there. Now, uh, it's interesting In verse 30, and he passing through the midst of them went his way. And I believe that's a miracle. That's the only miracle he did in that city. And that was a miracle somehow to pass through. See, and some people say, well, that wasn't a miracle. Wait a minute, it wasn't a miracle. They they were grabbing him. They were taking him. They, They wanted to go immediately to murder Jesus Christ. See, no question about that. And so what they do is they, um, uh, uh, he miraculously went through the crowd. That was a miracle of God because it wasn't his time to die at that time. And we know he was to die on Calvary for the sins of the world. But isn't it amazing? See, that's the miracle he showed them by by disappearing, so to speak, or somehow getting out of there uh, before they could murder uh, him. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is never politically correct. See, he doesn't say what... We want him to say, but he gives the word of God. And you say, if people are going to get saved, they're saved on the basis of the word of God. Not some hocus pocus experience, but the word of God. That's where, that's how we get saved. That's how we have our uh, salvation. Now, there's a tremendous application here, and we all see it very obviously. Everybody in that town knew Jesus Christ. He did some carpentry work at my house. I have a table that he made for me. See, everybody was familiar with Jesus Christ. Just like in America today. A lot of people are familiar with Jesus Christ, amen? They know about Jesus. They say, that's um, Mary's son. You see, what do you see here in the Word of God? It's possible to be familiar with Jesus and not be saved and not know him as your savior. How many people, even in our Bible-believing churches, well, I've always known about Jesus. I know about Jesus, but I'm familiar with him, but have you been saved through him? Do you know him as your person. In fact, I think all the witnesses here this morning, we'd all say, most all the people we talk to say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Amen? But see, are they saved? You see, 
It's one thing to be familiar with Jesus Christ. It's another thing to be saved. Great lesson here in the Word of God. All of these people were familiar with Jesus Christ. But the indication here in Luke's gospel, they all rejected him. Now, that's pretty sad when you want to murder Jesus Christ. That shows where you're at. That's a terrible thing. By the way, we all know if he came back today and uh, preached today, and we said, oh, Jesus Christ is here. He's coming. He's going to preach. Let's invite the community in. They'd come with stones, knives, guns. Uh, they do the same to Jesus today, no question about it. Jesus doesn't have any place in this world in which we live. But see, it's, can, we can be familiar with Jesus, doesn't mean we're saved. That's why people brought up in a Christian church, a Christian home, know about the Lord. They're familiar with Jesus, but are they saved? Do they know him as their Savior? I trust all of us will ask that question. And then... Uh, um, the Bible teaches here, Jesus left Nazareth. There's a lot of debate. At most, he may have come back one other time. Some Bible teachers believe he never came back to Nazareth. He could, if he did come back, it would have just been one time. You see, what's that tell us? They had their opportunity. They had the Word of God from the Savior, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they rejected that opportunity. And as a result of it, I'm sure most all of them were lost for uh, eternity. And then um, a very simple lesson here by way of application. You see, we think that Jesus is a nice guy who went around patting everybody on the back. And then everybody patted Jesus on the back. You know, he's a good guy. But here we learn that Jesus Christ causes rejection. Jesus Christ, uh, uh, knowing him, brings rejection. Turn, uh, and we'll close with this very quickly, and we're closed, uh, in Luke chapter 12. And we read here, in Luke chapter 12, and verse 51. See, now, we're studying the Gospel of Luke. Luke wants all of us to know, who is this Jesus you're following? You follow him. Everybody going to pat you on the back? Is he the one that went around uh, throwing rose petals to everybody? See, now, in uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. Luke 12, 51. I tell you, nay, no, but division. That's Jesus speaking. Did, did, didn't you come to bring peace? Everybody would love one another. Be peace in the world. No, he said, I came to bring division. Now, he says, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against his father, and the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against her mother, and the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. See, now what Jesus is saying there very, very clearly, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring division. And that might even be in your own home and in your own uh, uh, family. See, what we learn here is the teachings of Jesus are commonly rejected. Are the teachings of Jesus Christ, I'm going to the Bible now, I'm not talking about the liberal teaching. The real teaching of the Bible, is it accepted in our universities today? Is the teaching of Jesus Christ uh, accepted in our college camp or even in our high schools and elementary schools today? You say, no, it's rejected. See, it's the word of God is uh, rejected. See, Jesus brings division. That's the way Luke begins his gospel. There's a division, you see, and there are people that will not follow Christ. And by the grace of God, he brings out in the gospel of Luke, there are people that will follow him. We have to make that choice. 
and it's based on the Word of God. But always remember, say, if we're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, he said, I didn't come to bring you peace, division. That's the way it was in his ministry upon earth. That'll be the way it is in your life and in my life. Our Father, we pray that you might speak to our hearts, help us to grow and be edified and develop in the things of God. And Lord, what an amazing passage here in the Word of God. The hometown boy comes to his hometown synagogue and he preaches one sermon and everybody wants to murder him right there on the spot. Lord, help us to be edified. Help us take our stand for thee. And Lord, if there's someone who's not saved, someone who's familiar with Jesus, but they've never been saved, may they get saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's